Ladies and gentlemen, as the uh, chairman of ASPE, it is again my privilege to extend a welcome, this time to the conference dinner. And in so doing, could I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and their oldest past and present. I extend a particular welcome to our guest of honour, the commander of the US Pacific Fleet, Admiral Harry Harris, who is not only a great friend of Australia, but a great friend of ASPE and has spoken at our events before. We are meeting, of course, in a place of uh, honour, uh, dedicated to the heroism and sacrifice in defence of uh, ideals and values that both Australia and the United States share. In these magnificent surrounds tonight, I'm sure we're going to be focused on very important issues for the future to do with the Royal Australian Navy and other strategic issues that uh, challenge us. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it was the Greek philosopher so Sophocles who said once that it's necessary to wait until the evening to tell what kind of a day we've had. I think it's fair to say we've had an outstanding day in terms of the deliberations at the, at the conference. We look forward to the Admiral's remarks tonight continuing that, uh, that focus. To introduce our guest of honour, it's a privilege to ask the Managing Director of Saab Australia, one of our major sponsors, Dean Rosenfield, to come to the lectern and Dean will introduce the Admiral. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Dean Rosenfield, the MD of Saab. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, let me um, congratulate Peter Jennings and ASPE on organising and leading the discussion on Australia's future surface fleet. Now, as a company that's been intimately involved with the Australian Navy now for oh, almost 30 years, I'm very pleased, in fact, I'm very proud that Saab is one of the major sponsors participating in these discussions to ensure that we serve the ADF in the best possible way. Tonight, our guest speaker will cover the US perspective on coalition maritime operations in the Indo-Pacific, a region that consists of over 20 countries. It stretches from Russia in the north to Australia and New Zealand in the south, from India in the west, all the way through to the east with uh, Papua New Guinea. Now, as most people will be aware, that uh, over half the world's commercial shipping passes through the waterways of the Indo-Pacific region. The Strait of Malacca, in particular, is one of the most important shipping lanes in the world. The Strait links the Indian and Pacific Oceans and carries approximately 25% of all traded goods. It also carries 25% of oil by sea and 30% of the world's liquid nat uh, natural, uh, natural gas. At its narrowest point, just south of Singapore, the Strait of Malacca is only 1.5 nautical miles wide, making it one of the world's most noteworthy strategic choke points. It is this free flow of trade through the Indo-Pacific region that is vital to our continued economic growth as a region and indeed the world. Any disruptions would have serious ramifications should this flow cease, even for a limited period of time. Unfortunately, not everybody recognises or respects the flow of trade as much as we do. As a result, there is a, need, a, sorry, a continuous need for all interested parties to not only engage in dialogue, but also to exercise in more complex, integrated operations and training. Now, as was uh, recently highlighted in one of ASPE's uh, posts leading up to this event, this hasn't been lost on the United States either. Recently, the USC services, which consists of the Navy, the Marines and the Coast Guard, released their new strategy. It recognises the rising importance of this region and reaffirms the basic pillars of the US naval rebalance towards this part of the world, such as the forward deployment of 60% of Navy ships and aircraft to this region by 2020. With the Australian Navy currently procuring new and larger ships like the Air Warfare Destroyer, the landing helicopter docks and indeed the future frigates, operating as part of an American-led coalition will pose major challenges for not only the Navy but the entire ADF. It will also require much greater integration and interoperability of platforms, sensors, weapons and systems. 
Now, projecting Australia's sea power alongside a US ally will surely demand a transformed ADF. Tonight, we are joined by Admiral Harry Harris, Commander US Pacific Fleet. After graduating from the US Naval Academy in 1978, he was con commissioned initially as a Naval Pilot Officer and has logged over 4,400 flight hours, including more than 400 combat hours in maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft. He has served in every geographic combat and command region and has participated in major operations including Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, Willing Spirit, which is the, uh, the Columbia hostage uh, rescue in 2006-2007, and Odyssey Dawn in Libya in 2011. And for Odyssey Dawn, he served as the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander afloat. Admiral Harris assumed command of the US Pacific Fleet in October 2013, based in uh, Pearl Harbor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Admiral Harris to the stage. Thanks, Dean, for that kind introduction. And thanks to Saab and Lockheed Martin and Talis and all of the other sponsors of this conference. You all make it happen. And thanks to the folks at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute for all of your hard work in planning this conference. This is always an important venue to discuss new ideas so government leaders can make better informed decisions for Australia's future. But before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge a few folks here tonight. ASPE Executive Director Peter Jennings, Defense SA uh, CEO Malcolm Jackman, who was my first CEO, and I'll leave it to Malcolm to tell you how that happened. Parliamentarians, ambassadors, fellow flag and general officers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. How about that cricket match two days ago? I promise I won't say anything more than that. because we. And happy birthday uh, to the Royal Australian Air Force, which turns 94 years young tonight. So well done on that. So folks, it's a, it's a great pleasure indeed for me to be back in Australia and back in Canberra. I have to tell you that I was excited to speak at ASPE last year and I'm doubly so to be invited back this year. This rarely happens. So I'll, I'll, I'll attribute that to either your desperation or your curiosity, or both. At any rate, I am glad to be here. So this is my fourth trip to Australia as a U.S. Pacific Fleet Commander. I've visited no other country more in my 15 months on the job. It's wonderful to be here in this magnificent Australian War Memorial under the watchful gaze over there of G for George, uh, a truly fitting place to acknowledge the deep friendship and powerful alliance between Australia and the United States. And it's also a fitting place to underscore this year's 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli Campaign and the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZAC, whose sacrifices are forever remembered here. We can't say thank you enough. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm happy to see a big crowd here tonight, but I'm told the event organizers didn't ex anticipate this many people. So it turns out that Winston Churchill, the great man himself, once addressed a large crowd in the United States, and a member of the audience cornered him and by way of a compliment, a compliment said to him, doesn't it thrill you, Mr. Churchill, to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? So it is quite flattering, Churchill replied, but whenever I feel this way, I always remember if, instead of giving a speech I was to be hanged, the crowd would be twice as large. <laughs> so I'm flattered by the size of the crowd tonight, but I hope it wasn't originally half this big. Uh, but whatever your motivations, thank you all for being here. So this evening, I've been asked to talk about the, the uh, cooperative maritime operations in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. An important topic, a relevant topic, and without some forethought, a lengthy topic. So former U.S. Vice President Hubert Humphrey was known for his lengthy speeches. And his wife Muriel once told him, Hubert, for a speech to be immortal, it doesn't have to be eternal. So with that in mind, I intend to keep my remarks to the left of eternal, no matter how long it takes. 
So the Australian-U.S. alliance is a celebrated one. Our two nations have worked, fought, bled, and died together. We fought in World Wars I and II. We fought communism in the hot wars in Korea and Vietnam and the Cold War throughout the latter half of the last century. We fought together in the Gulf War, and for the last decade, we fought side by side in the long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Peter was right this morning when he opened the conference and said that Australia's allies and friends need Australia to play a large role in global security affairs. But I would go a step further and say that Australia needs Australia to play a leading role in global security, and indeed you have. Our coalition fight against ISIL is a perfect example. As Foreign Minister Bishop recently said, ISIL is, is an organization that seeks to drag the world back to the Dark Ages. ISIL threatens all law-abiding, freedom-loving nations, including Australia. So I applaud Australia's leadership in this fight. Defense Minister Andrews commented this morning, and I quote, Australia is a maritime nation, and we require maritime security, unquote. He could have said the same thing about the United States. Both of our countries have served together on the high seas in operations and exercises around the world for the last half century. We sailed together as part of multinational coalitions. Just this week, HMAS Success joined NATO's counter-piracy operation Ocean Shield to work with partner nations in the Gulf of Aden and in the Indian Ocean. And I applaud Australia's 29th deployment with command, Combined Task Force 150 to help maintain maritime security uh, in the Horn of Africa region. We're a highly successful team at sea because we practice at it and we train for it in exercises like Pacific Partnership and RIMPAC and Lungfish. We will conduct Talisman Sabre in just a few months. This is a high-end warfighting exercise designed to increase combat readiness and our ability to work with each other. Talisman Sabre is a big deal for the Pacific Fleet. We will have an amphibious ready group and a carrier strike group down here. The Royal Australian Navy and the U.S. Navy have robust exchange programs where our officers and enlisted personnel serve in each other's units. It might surprise you to know that we have 31 U.S. Navy sailors living, working, and studying in Australia today. Whenever and wherever the U.S. Navy and the Royal Australian Navy sail together, enhanced security and stability to follow. The link between our two great democracies is as important to our future as it has been to our storied past. And that's why I remain committed to my part in deepening the defense relationship with Australia. As we look into the future, er everyone recognizes that tremendous potential for economic growth here in this region. The Indo-Asia Pacific would drive the global economy for at least the rest of this century, an area that just so happens to have the largest maritime crossroads of international trade in the world. Oceans are the lifeblood of an interconnected global community. For centuries, our oceans have kept us apart. But in this globalized world, they are the pathways that bring us together. Obviously, security and stability in the maritime domain are critically important to economic prosperity, not just to us in America, not just to you here in Australia, but to all nations. But there's also a tremendous potential for disruption of economic prosperity in this volatile region. Mother Nature's got a mean streak in her that we have to prepare for. Just consider what happened over the past few weeks in Vanuatu. First, a 6.5 earthquake strikes, followed by a volcano erupting there for the first time in a century. And then Vanuatu's quarter million people were shocked by Cyclone Pam. I strongly commend Australia, New Zealand, France, the UK, and all those nations who reached out with speedy compassion and capability to aid the people of Vanuatu. But disruption, disruption comes in many forms. Consider tragedies like the loss of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 and AirAsia Flight 8501 last year, which served to demonstrate the importance of international cooperation in unexpected circumstances. And we must deal with terrorists and criminals and other nefarious actors vying for financial or political gain. We contend with complex issues like terrorism, cybercrime, piracy, trafficking in, in all its bad forms, transnational criminal activity, even the proliferations of weapons of mass destruction. Then there are volatile threats like North Korea, which just rejected calls to apologize 
for the deadly sinking of a South Korean Navy Corvette, the Chonin, which occurred five years ago last week. Forty-six sailors died in that attack, a powerful reminder that North Korea remains both a dangerous and unrepentant nation. It seeks nuclear weapons and a missile system that can deliver them throughout the region. That, folks, keeps me up at night. We also see the misuse of maritime claims by some coastal states. The excessive nature of these claims is creating uncertainty and instability. These are disruptions that compel us to increase cooperative efforts in this region, like those announced earlier this month right here in Canberra between Australia and Vietnam. Prime Minister Abbott said both nations, and I quote, support freedom of navigation by air and by sea in the South China Sea. We both deplore any unilateral changes to the status quo. We both think the dispute should be resolved peacefully and in accordance with international law, unquote. Competing claims by several nations in the South China Sea increase the potential for miscalculation. But what's really drawing a lot of concern in the here and now is the unprecedented land reclamation currently being conducted by China. China is building artificial land by pumping sand onto live coral reefs, some of them submerged and paving them over with concrete. China has now created over four square kilometers of artificial landmass, roughly the size of Canberra's Black Mountain Nature Reserve. The Indo-Asia Pacific region is known for its mosaic of stunningly beautiful islands, from Maldives to the Andamans, from Indonesia and Malaysia to the Great Barrier Reef in Tahiti. And I get to live in the beautiful Hawaiian Islands and in one of nature's great creations, a magnificent geography formed by millions of years of volcanic activity. In sharp contrast, China is creating a great wall of sand with dredges and bulldozers over the course of months. When one looks at China's pattern of provocative actions towards smaller claimant states, the lack of clarity on a sweeping nine-dash line, line, nine line claim that is inconsistent with international law and the deep asymmetry between China's capabilities and those of its smaller neighbors well, it's no surprise that the scope and pace of building man-made islands raise serious questions about Chinese intentions. The United States and other countries continue to urge all claimants to conform to the 2002 China ASEAN Declaration of Conduct, where their parties committed to exercise self-restraint in the conduct of activities that will complicate or, or, or escalate disputes and affect peace and security, peace and stability. How China proceeds will be a key indicator of whether the region is headed toward confrontation or cooperation. Like Australia, the United States has important ties to China. Secretary of State John Kerry recently said, quote, one thing that I know will contribute to maintaining regional peace and stability is a constructive relationship between the United States and China, unquote. We share economic and cultural ties and with millions of Americans of Chinese heritage in our nation, we share family ties. And we're all hopeful that China will become a contributor to stability and not a source of insecurity. But as we like to say in Navy circles, hope is not a strategy. So we must continue to constructively engage China, exploring new confidence-building measures while encouraging China to play a responsible role in supporting international rules and norms in the maritime domain. As author Robert Kaplan often talks about, maritime, about this maritime domain, in his recent book, Asia's Cauldron, he writes, Europe is a landscape and East Asia a seascape. Therein lies a crucial difference between the 20th and 21st centuries. Because of the way geography illuminates and sets priorities, the physical contours of East Asia argue for a naval century, unquote. And it certainly looks to me like it's shaping up that way. American leaders also recognize it's going to be an Indo-Asia Pacific century. And that's why we're conducting a whole of government rebalance to this region to include diplomatic, economic, and security spheres. From a, global, from a perspective of global prosperity, arguably the most critical of these spheres is the economic one. And we've got a lot of interagency civilian partners working on that vital piece. But the most visible piece, the most visible sphere, is a military one. Our military is playing an important role in the rebalance 
And I can assure you our naval forces have a big piece to play in this. Consider our Marines, some returning for a fourth rotation to Darwin. Lucky them. Now more than after, more than after a decade of fighting uh, land wars, our Marine Corps is returning to its roots and deploying from Navy ships, surging from the sea, if you will. We call this amphibiosity, a funny word that I first thought was a scientific name for your duckbill platypus. Well, amphibiosity is a new word for an old skill, one familiar to both our nations. Today, Australia is a leader in this specialized type of warfare. And with your new Canberra-class amphibious assault ships, I know that you'll continue to lead far into the foreseeable future. As part of our rebalance, we're bringing our new stuff to the Indo-Asia Pacific to work with your new stuff, like the amphibious assault ship USS America, built to deploy Marines equipped with MV-22 Ospreys, the new joint strike fighter and helicopters whenever and wherever they're needed. Not to mention MH-60 helicopters, Super Hornets, Growlers, Triton UAVs, and the mighty P-3's replacement, the P-8 Poseidon. Consider the powerful synergy that HMAS Canberra and USS America working together in an amphibious operation somewhere. So let me dispel any doubts. Our commitment to the rebalance remains steadfast. We're on a pace to have 60% of our Navy based in the Pacific by 2020. By maintaining a capable and credible forward presence in the region, we're able to improve our ability to maintain stability and security. And if any crisis does break out, we're better positioned to respond quickly. But I'm also a realist. I'm responsible for the U.S. Navy activities from Hollywood to Bollywood, from penguins to polar bears. And I know full well that the security effort of this large and important region is a shared challenge that demands shared solutions. We're stronger together. Now, the topic of this conference isn't lost on me while you're considering Australia's future surface fleet. This is an important issue for all of us who value having a strong and advanced Australian maritime presence to protect your national interests. Perhaps nothing demonstrates a nation's intent more vividly than a highly capable surface fleet. Way back in 1908, at the invitation of your Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin, the U.S. Navy's Great White Fleet visited Australia as it circumnavigated the world. It was the first visit of a non-Royal Navy fleet to Australian waters. Your leaders immediately recognized the value of such a fleet in protecting your shores and sea lanes. And they recognized the value of projecting power abroad to advance your national interests. Shortly after that visit, Australia ordered its first modern warships, and the rest is, as they say, history. In this naval century, any coastal nation without credible and capable maritime forces will be at a disadvantage. So I applaud your efforts to bring the new Hobart-class air warfare destroyers into the fleet. With their Aegis systems, the Hobarts will further increase interoperability between our navies, enabling even closer collaboration than ever before. In fact, I'll be flying to Adelaide tomorrow to visit the shipyard there to see these beauties firsthand. But, before, but beyond the new Canberra and Hobart-class ships, and even the C-5000 project, which is the subject of this conference, plans for the Royal Australian Navy of the latter half of the 21st century must be conceived soon. These are strategic decisions that only you can make, choices that will have ripple effects in the coming decades, choices that will define your nation's place in the middle and the latter half of this century. Australia and the United States must continue to invest in our nation's capabilities to sustain our nation's edge. And we must work assiduously to ensure we can operate together, whether the mission is AAW, ASW, or BMD. Like the great 21st century warrior philosopher, Lieutenant Commander Mike Felber, my aide, once said, We must invest to evolve. We must innovate to survive. We must invest to evolve. We must innovate to survive. Well, folks, in order for me to survive, I need to wrap up this speech. I recall a story about a public speaker back in the 1800s who unexpectedly died. There wasn't much money to cover his funeral expenses, so his friends decided to collect a few dollars necessary for his burial. They didn't meet with much success until they called upon a man 
who showed quite a bit of interest when the phrase public speaker was used. How much did you say you wanted? He said, $5, they replied. Well, he said, here's 25, go find and bury five of them. <laughs> so I hope my remarks haven't inspired the same sentiments in any of you. But just in case you're reaching for your wallets, let me quick and quickly conclude with the following thought. We live in an interconnected world of shared spaces, where we share the oceans, the air, the outer space, and even cyberspace. These spaces en enable the free flow of goods, services, thoughts, and ideas. They are the connective tissue that holds together the global economy, and more importantly, a civil society. Access to these thoroughfares is at risk due to increasing competition and unfortunately the provocative behaviors of some international actors. Each nation in this region has plenty at stake in this naval century. And through cooperative maritime operations, our combined efforts can help maintain the security needed for continued prosperity and peace. That's why the United States and Australia and all our allies, partners, and friends in this region remain committed to fostering a rules-based system that respects international law and adherence to international values. As we sail into the future together, we must remain committed to ensuring unfettered access to shared spaces. There are three great ships that ply the high seas, friendship, partnership, and leadership. And forums like this are the rudders that steer those ships toward cooperation and a more prosperous future. Folks, thank you for your attention and kindness tonight. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a very pleasant task on your behalf to thank uh, Admiral Harris for another outstanding address to a gathering, uh, sweeping in its scale, detailed in its analysis. Could I ask everyone to join me in thanking our guest of honour, Admiral Harris, for his address tonight.